I'm Raghav Kapoor, the CEO and a co-founder at Smart Karma. We are now halfway through Inside 2020. The last two days have featured dedicated tracks on credit, financials, supply chains, capital markets, as well as M&A. It has been a great opportunity for us all to dial into conversations with experts and top speakers, even while observing a strict lockdown. Many of you have also taken this as an opportunity to make charitable donations to COVID relief via UNICEF from the Insight 2020 website. We're very grateful. Starting today, our conference begins to take a closer look at the changing face of consumption and sectors where we see positive structural tailwinds pick up speed. With this, we would like to kick off this morning's track on e-commerce, or shall I say, all commerce. We're really honored to have with us this morning, Mr. Piyush Gupta. Piyush, as Amanda mentioned earlier, leads strategic development team at Sequoia Capital India and Southeast Asia. Sequoia, as we all know, is one of the most preeminent investors of our generation, and it also ranks among Smart Karma's top shareholders. At Sequoia, Piyush works very closely with portfolio companies to create strategic engagement with both global corporates as well as new investors. Prior to joining Sequoia, Piyush was a managing director at Deutsche Bank, where he led their TMT investment banking team across India and Southeast Asia. Here's a lesser known fact about Piyush. He has helped raise more than $11 billion worth of capital in his career spanning over 17 years so far. And that's probably a very conservative estimate given what the Sequoia portfolio has done just in the last 12 months. So today, Piyush will kick off this session with a very brief presentation where he would explore two key facets. The first is an examination of the impact of COVID on e-commerce across the region and also across Sequoia's portfolio companies. And the second will be a behind the scenes view of the current environment for fundraising. This, I will admit, is a topic close to the heart of many founders and CEOs that have dialed in this morning. Piyush is a very enduring chap and I won't be satisfied without us engaging in some Q&A towards the end. So we will spend the second half of this fireside chat discussing pertinent questions from the audience, as well as those that have been sent in advance. Now, without further ado, good morning, Piyush. Welcome to Inside 2020. Morning, Raghav. Thanks for having us. Good to see you. <laughs> yes. Uh, Piyush, um, given you've uh, prepared the short presentation, uh, would you mind sort of just sharing your screen and kicking off with that? Great. So let me just jump into it, Raghav. I think what, um, you know, given the 30 minutes that we have, what I wanted to talk about today was, you know, on the commerce track, you know, we want to talk about firstly, you know, what are the sectors and the companies that we are seeing in our portfolio being positively impacted? Uh, so there is a silver lining to this, you know, whole COVID uh, impact going around the world. And some of it, I think, will be here to stay. And then I also want to take a fundraising and other likely developments that will evolve over the next 12 to 24 months in our view. So let me start by the slide on, you know, where has the sec which sector, I mean, we know what's been badly impacted, like offline retail, offline payments, uh, many of the offline models. But here are the specific sectors that have seen a very strong positive impact. So online education, you know, this has been a big theme for Sequoia India in the last you know, few years. We are investors in many of the leading companies in different parts of the value chain. So Baiju's, uh, which focuses on you know, K3 to K12, science and math remote education, uh, Class Plus, which is a software-led uh, company for educators and tuition centers, uh, doubt not, which solves uh, children's questions online. Um, you know, eruditis, which is much more executive education, uh, online edu executive education. Uh, Interview bit or Scalar Academy, which focuses on coding skills. And Unacademy, Academy, which is one of India's largest test prep companies. So all these companies have seen surges in, in consumer usage. They've seen CACs, uh, uh, CACs drop to, you know, very low or negligible numbers. And you know, this is an, as you know, an online education, just like this online seminar is an acquired taste. If you could meet in person, 
you know, hang out before the session, after the session, it would be a lot easier and preferable. But, you know, we learn to do this. And similarly, online education also is seeing a surge of adoption. And I think people will find that when content is great, it's worthwhile to log in uh, and, and listen. So I think these companies are going to benefit secularly from this. E-tailing in grocery, I think we've seen the, the buyer numbers and the frequency of orders surge in Tokopedia. Uh, same with Grofers. Tokopedia is uh, Indonesia's largest e-commerce company and Grofers is one of the largest online grocery companies in India. Both have seen very strong usage metrics um, and Grofers, you know, trending strongly towards profitability on the back of the tailwinds around that in a, in a, in a what is a difficult, uh, you know, uh, category to build and they've done a fabulous job. Digital health, you know, 1MG Practo, you know, these companies from a regulatory support perspective have seen a surge in regulators adopting and promoting their platforms for telemedicine, for home delivery of medication, for home diagnostic, uh, you know, for uh, blood tests and other things. And Bioformis, which is more of a device-led health monitor, uh, you know, has been approved in, in a couple of ex uh, experiments in cities to actually pre-indicate uh, COVID or presence of COVID, uh, you know, through the monitors that they do real time, you know, via uh, devices worn on, on, you know, like Fitbits and so on. You know, uh, the last sector I talk about here in some uh, color is digital content and online gaming. So Octro, Moonfrog, which are card-based games, MPL, which is a gaming platform with multiple uh, categories of games on it. You know, as people have stayed home, similar to what we saw in China, the usage has gone up. I think Octro doubled their user numbers and doubled their revenues, you know, literally from three months ago to now, just given the surge uh, in, in volume. And I think also applies, like, um, there's also a company called Daily Hunt, which, uh, you know, is a, uh, it's a content aggregator platform in India, uh, both across news and other light, light content. And that has also seen a surge in, in usage. So look, I think overall, so these sectors are going to stay quite positive. I think the one thing that does tie all this is online payments and logistics, which are also seeing a very strong surge in volume. And uh, I think we might have seen Amazon articulate that, uh, you know, that logistics uh, has been a constraint. And I think we've seen the payment stocks around the world run up. So PayPal, Adyen. So as more people go online and do online shopping and online purchases, I think it's been incredible. Uh, a tailwind for online payments. Just quickly moving on to the next page. You know, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, many, many investors and industry participants want to know how are these companies surviving? And different countries have different degrees of lockdowns from Indonesia to India and even here in Singapore. So I want to highlight a statistic. If you look at this chart from 2014 through 16, you know, in an average year, we raised $8 billion. This is for growth equity and, and, and private equity investments, uh, you know, and this is a CB Insights uh, data. So, and that in the last three years has doubled to close to $18 billion annual average raise. That has mean that a lot of companies are coming into this crisis with strong cash positions. So we don't have liquidity issues, but what we do have is we have, is we have revenue challenges. So how are companies responding? They're responding by reducing costs, like cutting down projects, which were not immediately relevant, which had a more long-term focus. They're reducing costs in terms of employee headcounts or salaries where it's feasible and in compliance with the laws. Um, and just to give you a sense in Q1, you can see the tailwinds continuing into as late as Q1. So Q1 closed deals obviously reflect what is happening in the last, you know, end of the last uh, part of the 2019. But just Sequoia portfolio companies in India, Southeast Asia, you know, raised $2.8 billion between them. You know, notably Gojak, Baiju, Zomato, Unacademy, Pine Labs, and many others. So, so you can see how strong the cash positions in, in most companies are as the funding environment has been strong and companies have taken advantage of that. Um, let me move to the next page. But what's our view from here, right? I think that's the big question. So while we all know that the public markets recovered, you know, have recovered quite nicely, and I think you can see S&P 500 is still 10% below the starting of the year, but NASDAQ and China, uh, CSI 300 have recovered. We do believe 
that the liquidity spillover and confidence return into private markets will happen with a lag. So all the trillions of dollars of liquidity being unleashed around the world by central banks and, and federal governments in their economies to support this, this time of COVID, just as we saw post the last GFC, is going to mean that asset price inflation is going to continue in both public markets and private markets. But in private markets, we expect that to happen with a lag. And therefore, companies are obviously being very careful of their runways. Uh, here's another point. You know, continued momentum in early stage VC deals. I think just at Sequoia uh, India, we have approved a number of new investments in the last few weeks. So I think early stage VC deals, which have a long-term horizon of moonshots are going to continue. Though I think the players will be more selective and the more stable funds will have an advantage uh, in this period of uncertainty. So we certainly expect to benefit from some of that. It's the late stage investments where we do expect a flight to quality, a, you know, a combination of that valuation corrections and also longer distance cycles. You know, I think for companies to write large, for investors to write example of flight to quality, this funding was announced after COVID's impact had already been clear in the business and the economy, and yet they announced a $1.2 billion additional funding in the Series F round, right? So kudos to their team uh, and for pulling it off, but also it shows you that investors are still willing to bet high quality companies. And then another example from India that we've all seen, where some humongous checks have been written, you know, I think I would say that Facebook was maybe a bit more strategic, but we start GA Silver Lake, very much financial animals driven by financial returns. Uh, and, and to see them write almost two and a half billion dollars of capital between them in an in a unlisted entity has been phenomenal to see you know, that, that come through. The next point, which I think is going to happen is that M&A will be a very important tool for many of the companies in the private spaces to enter new markets, consolidate market share, and also improve financial profile. And I want to give a couple of examples of this. So, you know, last year, Pine Labs acquired a company called Quicksilver. So Pine Labs is India's largest private, uh, you know, processing company at point of sale. I think they run rate about $30 billion in TPV before COVID hit. So a very significant part of the digital economy. And they acquired India's largest prepaid issuance and processing platform called Quicksilver. You know, this became a very important tool that had synergies and, and Pine Labs, which had been trying to build that product themselves for many years unsuccessfully going up against Quicksilver, certainly found itself, you know, where, where in a very good space uh, with an, another important driver to the business and a combination of both offline plus offline, online. Uh, Carousel, as we know, you know, acquired uh, OLX Philippines and then they acquired a group of assets from Telenor in Malaysia, Vietnam, and created very strong revenue momentum and market leadership across, I believe, four markets. And then Zomato consolidated Uber Eats in India. So what I'm trying to say is that we are going to see more of this. There is going to be a lot more openness from shareholders and then founders to be pragmatic about what's the best way to create significant economic value. So M&A, which I think is a very under, underutilized toolkit in India, Southeast Asia specifically, you know, we will see a lot more of this where egos will be set aside and companies will come together to have, you know, kind of economic value in enhancement discussions. Um, you know, I think this is one of my final uh, slides and, and Raga, we can talk, um, is, is diversity in capital structure. So, you know, it, it's funny how underdeveloped the markets around alternative financings in Asia are. So if you look at US between Silicon Valley Bank and Gladebrook Partners and many of the large funds like BlackRock and many others, venture debt, pre-IPO debt for tech companies, uh, convertibles or private convertibles even, are a very nice part of the toolkit where companies are sensitive to dilution, valuation and other things. So Airbnb is a good example. You know, business obviously was down significantly as is publicly known. And they raised a billion dollars in debt 
you know, as they navigated the the cancellations, refunds, and the drop in and the drop in volumes. Expedia, you know, it's public company. They used a, a perpetual preferred and a debt financing, you know, very clever combination uh, to kind of not dilute too much at low valuations in this time. And then Gladebrook talked about, you know, how there's so much opportunity in tech debt. Now we don't see all that in, in Asia yet, right? So I was talking to Traveloka in Tokopedia and I said, how much bank debt do you have? And senior bank debt and said, we have zero, right? And that's a story that's across almost all our companies. And as you know, many of our companies are very significant size players and they're all equity funded. We believe that's going to change in this next wave of evolution of the capital markets in, in, our, in our region. We, will, we are likely to see the participants, the participation of significant financial investors in these alternative sources. And I think Sequoia is actually playing a very strong driving role in that, where we are bringing some of these partners to our region, talking with our companies, engaging with them to drive some of these financing uh, availability uh, to them. So, so that's really it. I think just wanted to maybe take 30 seconds to summarize, you know, what I just went through. Uh, first has been that COVID impact has been divergent across sectors, and we've certainly seen some sectors which have done, you know, very well, and, and some of those tailwinds are likely to stay, which are structural changes as consumer habits change. Number two is that we've had an incredibly positive funding environment for the last few years, and therefore many companies Many large companies have gone into the crisis with strong cash positions, and we are solving for business issues, but not for liquidity issues. I think the story is different in younger companies, which, which run with shorter runways, and I think there we'll see more challenges. Uh, number three is it is our realistic expectation that while public markets have been quick to rally, and, you know, private markets, especially in emerging markets, are going to take longer to recover. Uh, and before we see uh, capital from the West, you know, continue being invested in this. Uh, four is late stage investments. We are we expect to see a combination of flight to quality towards better companies with better unit economics, higher scale, market leadership. That'll become more important than ever. And then we 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 could see valuation corrections and certainly longer decision cycles for investors to write long checks. Then MA, I think, will be we hope and we expect will be a very important uh, theme going forward. Uh, to create value where there's too many, you know, where there's too much of a crowded, uh, you know, sector, or you know, companies are burning too much to get to a certain scale and and harming, you know, the overall ecosystem, and finally the diversity in capital structure, which I think is 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 important part uh, and and a natural part of the evolution in the in the capital markets. So with that, I will stop, uh, Raghav, and happy to you know chat. Fantastic. Pierce, thank you very much. That was uh, very succinct, yet extremely informed, and I appreciate that. Well, there's a, there's a whole bunch of questions here, and what I'll try and do is I'll try and bunch them into categories, uh, which fit across the slides you just presented. So let me start with something that's at the heart of everything we do at Smart Karma, and also clearly a big focus for Sequoia, which is quality. And in this environment, you talk about a flight to quality. So let, let's, let's drill down a little bit deeper. In your opinion, what determines quality? And you know, how does Sequoia really reinforce or check for quality across their portfolio? Um, so Raghav, I think quality means from an in flight to quality here in the private markets, I think here we are talking about some things like market leadership. So, so scale, size of the market, you know, what's the market leadership? What's the monetization like? As we know that transaction models have been preferred, subscription models have been preferred, which creates, creates stability in revenues. You know, what are the unit economics like? As you know, companies have been architected in the bull markets where the unit economics have not been great, right? And the burns are too high. And I think investors play very close attention. So I think a very common theme that we are hearing from new investors is, hey, what is the near term path to profitability and what is the steady state profitability and the steady state profitability should not be you know like two years out but hopefully with shorter you know time frames how far is this company away from ipo because people do believe that ipos impose a very strong sense of discipline uh, on profitability and operating and operating cost control for companies so that's what it means and look you know we make our bets early and markets evolve companies evolve 
But I'm just saying from a late stage perspective, Raghav, you know, that's what new investors are looking for. When they're writing large checks, they want to see a near term path or a, a, certainly a well-defined path to, to IPOs or, or whatever else. Uh, thanks, Piyush. Uh, I guess that leads very nicely into the next question. Uh, you talk about, you know, a path to profitability, path to IPO, and you've also, you had a great chart in your presentation about how public markets have snapped back a lot faster than perhaps private markets will rebound. So do you notice that contrast uh, having a lasting, lasting sort of impact in a post-COVID era, i.e. that uh, public markets lead privates? Because that would be a stark contrast to what we saw before COVID. And do you not see an even higher flight towards private and alternatives given uh, you know, the mark-to-market -market volatility that you see in public markets? Yeah. See, that is a good question, Raghav. I think, look, you know, when I say go, go public and go IPO, I think it means IPO ability. An IPO-able company means the company has scale, market leadership, it has, you know, revenue visibility over certain quarters, it has profits. Now, whether those companies choose to go public or not is a separate question. But when we think about IPO ability, we mean that the markets, as we saw in the case of Uber and Lyft, you know, that they rapidly imposed discipline on those companies and the companies took action to, you know, shorten their paths to break evens, right? I think both Uber announced that, hey, we will be, you know, again, I'm talking about pre-COVID, they shortened their paths to cut down expenses. Uh, so I think that's what I mean from uh, IPO ability. Now, whether companies choose to stay private for longer, like that is always a decision. You know, sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. But what I am seeing is that in, in, the, in this crisis, public companies have had incredible access to liquidity. So through, I mean, even the cruise line companies have raised capital around them, right? That shows you value being public. So actually, actually, I think that this crisis is going to reinforce the value of being public. If you look at Airbnb, also in a similar space, as other badly impacted travel and, and hospitality sectors, but ranging from Marriott to cruise lines to other hotel companies, you know, they all were able to raise capital at much cheaper terms than Airbnb. So Airbnb paid a price for being a private company. So I think here, actually, I'm going to see a reverse where companies will see that, hey, you know, public companies are maybe better built uh, for withstanding shocks in the system like this. Pierce, that's, that's actually uh, a very, very good insight. Thank you for that. Um, I want to I want to sort of uh, now focus the attention on a capital structure and uh, you know M and A specifically, but sort of two themes that you spoke about. So I I would like to understand from you what are some of the capital structures that are being deployed towards M and A transactions by larger private companies. You know, uh, it, what sort of combinations of script and cash, or you know maybe even alternate currency that you see being used for companies to to sort of unite yeah so Raghav, here i think there's no standard answer right i think where companies can pay outright cash they will pay it where it makes sense to get alignment therefore stock is more used as a currency so i'll give you an example and examples are used uh, pine labs chose to pay 100 percent cash to quicksilver shareholders for 100 percent acquisition they said look we do not want uh, we're happy to pay cash we don't want to create bloat our cap table and they had the ability you know backed by strong shareholders such as Temasek and, and paypal and others who backed the acquisition and they were happy to pay 100 percent cash in the case of carousel they've actually paid all stock you know so they paid all stock and on top of the stock um, swap for buying the assets in philippines and 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 um, malaysia and so on they also received additional cash investments from telenor and olx uh, so I think we have, it depends on what objectives we are trying to solve. I think the larger the deal size is, typically you would see more stock. I think for tuck-in acquisitions, adjacent spaces that a company trying to get into, you know, there you could pay much more of a cash-oriented deal. So I'm not seeing any of the alternative currencies if you refer to bitcoins or anything else. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Uh, now that's that's really insightful because. Um, I wanted to get a sense of whether in a cash deprived environment is the focus really on cash driven M&A and hence companies with balance sheets win or are founders willing to, to use your phrase, set aside egos 
a new script as a good uh, funding tool. And, and you've given examples of both, so that's, that's helpful. Uh, let's, let's switch focus a little bit, and I want to club together a few questions from the audience here. Let's talk about e-commerce giants, at least in this part of the world, uh, Southeast Asia and India. Uh, you know, some people refer to them as super apps, but to use an old world or old economy analogy, these seem to be the conglomerates of the future. Um, what, what, you know, what, what sort of uh, opportunities do you see, see them pursuing now? You know, and, I, and I'm talking about insights that you've picked up from board table conversations, right? What do you really fund as an e-commerce giant going forward? And which categories or business segments do you actually downweight uh, insofar as resource allocation is concerned? Got it. I think, Raghav, lots of questions in there. Um, so firstly, for super apps or conglomerates, it's an interesting um, phrase that you use there. Uh, what we're going to see is that, you know, when you have such, you know, massive transacting platforms, which have a consumer relationship, it is easy to add things on. See, why are the Googles and Apples so dominant and they can just add services, you know, and Google can launch Meet and, you know, be number two in like three weeks because distribution matters. So what we're going to see is the creation of these giant companies, which are very, you know, very strong distribution because whatever they can add on, they'll add on. Now, I think some of the challenges being that maybe the build up to those large super app has been tough in the sense that core economics have not been great for some of the companies. Maybe sectors were too competitive. I think but we have seen that change very rapidly towards a lot more normalized rational behavior. And therefore, financial services, I think, is going to be an important part to add on. And why? Because you know, financial services is chronically underserved, underpenetrated in our markets, and they also represent very large profit pools. So if you look at the market caps of banks and NBFCs and insurance companies in our markets, they actually tend to top many of the stock indices, which is very unlike what's happened in the US where tech companies have taken over. So I think we're going to see a, a decade long transition of financial services by these large companies where they'll distribute your know, loans and, and insurance and other financial products to, to consumers at very low CACs, very low cost to serve. Uh, and that's what I think is going to be a key, you know, def, de, defining period, uh, you know, for, for these companies. And there'll be lots more. But, you know, as you saw, like, you know, I'll give you an example. Zomato was, it was uh, you know, obviously a very large food delivery pair. And through COVID, they added grocery. And they might be in the top four online grocers in, in India within the space of four weeks. Right, that is incredible, and that just shows you distribution. Uh, Piyush, that's really helpful. Uh, we've got, uh, I guess, the last 90 seconds or so before we transition to the next session today. So I'm just going to ask you uh, one or two rapid-fire questions. Uh, so, so this is a multiple choice. You've got to pick one. Uh, big is better or small is beautiful? Big is better. Okay, uh, are you a buyer or a seller of uh, the S&P? Seller. Are you a buyer or a seller of uh, your own portfolio at the moment? We are, we are trying to add, in fact. I think we are, op you know, look, I think everything is in the context of time. Even for S&P, short-term seller, long-term buyer. Uh, I think our part portfolio, longer companies that we have held, we are open to liquidity, but for younger companies, we want to hold them and treasure them, you know, and nurture them for as long as we can. Thank you. Piyush, thank you so much for, uh, you know, being insightful and entertaining at the same time. And I, and I call you an endearing chap for, for that very reason. Uh, with that, um, I am now going to hand it back to our host to transition into the next uh, session for this morning. Thank you again, Piyush. Really nice Thanks, to have Raghav. you with us this morning. Bye-bye. Take care. Thank you, Raghav. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.